Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Implementing HIV Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis, or PrEP, in a Homeless Primary Care Clinic. I'm Lauren Berner, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, presented by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration and the Bureau of Primary Health Care. This is a 60-minute presentation with the last 15 minutes reserved for Q&A. There's a chat box below the presentation slides for participant questions and technical issues. Please type your questions or technical issues into the chat box at any time during the presentation. A select number of questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Remaining questions will be logged and provided to the presenters for written responses after the webinar. If you're having technical issues, you may also call Caroline Gumpenberger at the Council's office. That number is 615-226-2292, extension 222 for assistance. A copy of the slide deck is available in the resources pod on the bottom right corner of your screen, and materials in the recording will be available on our website soon. Our presenters today are from the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System. Um, we have Elizabeth Gregg, a family nurse practitioner, Emma Nace, uh, also a family nurse practitioner, and Carrie Lynn, a pharmacist. Um, thank you all for joining us, and I'll hand it over to you for today's presentation. Thank you so much um, for this really wonderful opportunity to share with this group the work that our um, quality improvement team has been invested in for the past year. Um, we are in actually joined by some of our other um, QI project team members today, including Sonia Jefferson, our social work representative, uh, Noah Ravenberg, one of our internal medicine residents that worked with us, and we have our faculty advisors, uh, Brianna Cohen and Lillian Gelberg with us on the call as well. We do anticipate one other person to join us, um, and that will be Jennifer Fulker, who is our infectious disease specialist. So hopefully she finds her way to be on the call at some point. Um, I also just want to really thank um, Hannah and Lauren for this opportunity. And on our side, uh, Carrie and uh, Lillian for their work getting this set up. So without further ado, let's get started. So our objectives for this webinar uh, this afternoon are to provide a brief review of HIV and the development of pre-exposure prophylaxis, otherwise known as PrEP for HIV, to review HIV acquisition risk factors that may be overrepresented in the homeless population, to provide up-to-date recommendations to initiate PrEP in the primary care setting, and to describe the QI project in a primary care clinic serving homeless veterans, which is where we are, which is the West LA VA Homeless Patient Aligned Care Team, otherwise known as HPACT. So a brief review of um, the history of HIV. Um, the earliest cases have been tracked down to the 1930s and 40s. And then there was a slow spread of the disease through Africa and to other parts of the world, lasting until the uh, early to mid-70s. During the 70s and 80s, there was a rapid increase in infection rates. And in the early 1980s, uh, the rare cases of pneumonia, cancer, and opportunistic infections that were showing up in emergency rooms and primary care providers led to the identification and characterization of HIV and AIDS. As I'm sure we all know, those initial cases were always fatal. By the late 80s, the first antiretroviral medications had been developed, and uh, things began to look a little bit better for patients diagnosed. And by the late 90s, we had improved therapies that could suppress the viral load to such an extent that allowed HIV to be considered a chronic disease in those who actually had access to treatment. Today in the United States, about 1.1 million people live with HIV infection. The CDC uh, estimates that about 162,000 of those persons do not know that they have HIV. Again, this is that information displayed uh, through a nice infographic by the CDC. The main takeaways here are that there are many people living with HIV who do not know their diagnosis. And of those who do know their diagnosis, only slightly over half are well-controlled on medications. 
or virally suppressed. In 2019, the Health and Human Services launched an HIV initiative to eradicate HIV in the United States with a four-prong um, plan for ending the HIV epi epidemic. Diagnosing HIV as early as possible, treating HIV quickly and effectively, protecting people at risk, and responding quickly to clusters of new cases. And this is why primary care has a very important part in this initiative. About one in two people with HIV have the virus at least three years before diagnosis, and about 70% of people saw a healthcare provider in the 12 months prior to diagnosis and failed to be diagnosed. And about 87% of new HIV infections are transmitted from people who don't know they have HIV or are not retained in treatment. Uh, per the CDC, this is the current patterns for HIV transmission. Uh, the current predominant pattern in the United States is men who have sex with men. However, heterosexual men and women make up just under a quarter of new cases. If we're to prevent HIV acquisition, we cannot continue to view HIV as a concern only to the LGBT community. And IV drug use, along with other risk factors, also account for about 10% of new transmission. This is a slide of lifetime risk for HIV diagnosis by transition group, transmission group. This is the same information uh, in a slightly different manner about who is at the highest risk related to behavior. This is a slide that shows uh, patterns for who is being diagnosed in the United States. And in, just to make a little nomenclature, PWID stands for people who inject drugs. The biggest takeaway here is that there are racial and ethnic differences among diagnosis patterns. While overall, uh, men who have sex with men diagnosis have remained stable, White men who have sex with men have had a marked drop in diagnosis, while African American men have remained stable, and there's been a marked increase in diagnosis among the Hispanic and Latino communities. For risk factors for acquiring HIV, the bloodborne virus, the two most common current modes of transmission are through sexual transmission or IV drug use. Uh, we are past the, the place where people are getting HIV through uh, blood donation. For sexual transmission, the highest risk groups are people who are not in a mutually monogamous relationship with a partner who has recently tested HIV negative and who do not regularly use condoms or barrier protection during sex with partners of unknown HIV status. For IV transmission, the risk is anyone who has injected any substance in the past six months and who has ever shared injection equipment. Uh, the other group is people who have unprotected sex with a partner who have the above risk factors or occupational risks for medical providers, although that is a very low risk pool. When we want to think about uh, the HIV risk in the homeless community, which is very near and dear to our hearts working with homeless veterans, um, there are some very unique risk factors for the homeless community, and they live at the intersection of multiple risk factors. Uh, about 11 to 40 percent of homeless individuals identify as LGBT, and surveys about 40 percent of homeless individuals report having engaged in survival sex at least once during their period of homelessness. And survival sex is uh, defined as a transactional sex act engaged in by a person because of their extreme need. It describes the practice of people who are homeless or otherwise disadvantaged in society, trading sex for money, food, a place to sleep, other basic needs, or for drugs. And again, uh, for the homeless community, there's a special note, there's been some research done in Los Angeles that suggests that the period of transition from homeless to permanent supportive housing produce, um, pr 
provides an opportunity for intervention as that transition itself can increase risk factors for uh, sexually transmitted HIV protection as people begin to feel a little bit more relaxed and have privacy and have access to a safe place to be. About 25% of homeless individuals report low rates of barrier protection during a sexual act, and about 30 to 50% of homeless individuals report using IV drug use at some point. All of these things combined lead to home, higher HIV rates in the homeless population. Studies show that um, homeless persons are five to 10 times more likely to have HIV than the stably housed population, and rates of HIV infection among homeless persons in the United States are between 2 and 10 percent. And overall, higher HIV acquisition rates among homeless persons who have substance use and mental illness. And just for a comparison, um, the overall HIV infection rate in the United States is 0.3 percent, so the rate of HIV infection among homeless persons going from 2 to 10 percent represents a pretty significant increase in risk. Uh, the next slide is about HIV prevention strategies. As we've talked about a little bit, there's barrier protection, condoms, dental dams, clean needles programs, needle exchange, uh, post-exposure -expo prophylaxis, PEP, which we will not be talking about in this presentation, and then pre-exposure prophylaxis, which we are talking about, and routine STD screening and treatment. At this stage, I'm going to uh, transfer the presenter uh, to Carrie, who's our pharmacist, who will then review with you what PrEP is. All right, thank you very much. So a little bit of background about PrEP itself. It was approved by the FDA in July of 2012. It's a combination medication, so two different medications in one tablet, uh, tenofovir diproxyl fumarate and emtricitabine, just to be taken once a day. And just another note about PrEP is that it's now a grade A recommendation by the U.S. Preventive Task Force that it's now a standard of care and should be offered to all at-risk individuals. A little bit more background about PrEP is that it's just to really emphasize that it's the use of an antiretroviral medication for the prevention of HIV acquisition. So it's indicated for those who are HIV negative and who are at risk of contracting HIV. As far as who's indicated for PrEP, it's important to assess the sexual risk factors. As we mentioned before, the two main risk factors for HIV acquisition are sexual behaviors as well as IV drug use. So it's important to keep in mind um, certain methods for actually assessing uh, sexual risk factors, and that kind of includes the five Ps, which includes assessing more information about partners, practices, past history of STI, protection against STI, and as well as pregnancy plans. It's also important to assess risk factors as far as uh, drug use goes. So just to keep in mind that uh, what we want to make sure is that we put questions in context, um, really uh, assessing um, as for example, some of my patients have used drugs such as heroin. Have you used such drugs? So just putting things into context like that to get more information. Assessing history of IV drug use specifically and getting kind of a timeline of that. So in the last six months, for example, have you used any IV drugs? And then what type of drugs are being used? How it's being administered? And then harm reduction practices, uh, for example, where they're getting their needles and what their practices are. As far as the effectiveness of HIV PrEP, it's been shown to be really very um, effective. So um, the daily use of PrEP has been shown to be, so multiple studies have been done, as you can see. 
And as you can see, um, HIV acquisition has been reduced by more than 90%. And for IV drug use, HIV acquisition has been reduced by more than 70%. So as you can see, this is a list of studies that have kind of looked at how effective HIV PrEP use has been. As far as contraindications for the use of PrEP, uh, one of the contraindications is the inability to successfully take a daily medication. So adherence to the medication is pretty important. Um, some studies are looking at kind of the as-needed method, but right now it's FDA approved for daily use. So this is what we uh, emphasize is that the, the adherence is good for this medication. Um, HIV positive individuals, that would be a, a contraindication to the medication. As I noted earlier, it's only for HIV negative individuals at risk. Uh, renal function, uh, defined as creatinine clearance less than 60 milliliters per minute, is a contraindication for PrEP, as well as HIV exposure within the last 72 hours. And at that point, you would want to evaluate for PEP that we briefly mentioned earlier. Just also of note um, on the adherence, um, for example, in our clinic where we work with homeless uh, veterans and patients, this is where we just might want to monitor more frequently just to ensure that these patients are adherent to the medication. Other considerations to keep in mind for prescribing PrEP is noting uh, to test for a hepatitis B infection. Um, because this medication can also be used to treat hepatitis B, so we want to know what the status is of that infection. Uh, we want to know pre pregnancy plans, including if patients are currently pregnant, plan to become pregnant, uh, plan to conceive with one's partner, or are breastfeeding. Just note that uh, this medication is safe in pregnancy. Observational studies up to this point have not found increased risk in birth defects, and um, it's kept track in an antiretroviral pregnancy registry at this point. Um, but it is safe to use in pregnancy, and just keep in mind that Truvada is part, used as part of combination therapy for HIV treatment in pregnant individuals. This table here just kind of shows a summary of guidance for PrEP use, uh, just to kind of put together a lot of the things that we've mentioned and will mention. It closely reflects the guidelines that are laid out by the CDC as well. So just a couple of things to note from this table is that they talk about a um, high number of sexual partners being a risk factor. Just note that this isn't actually truly defined. This isn't a specific number that's ever really been defined for certain. And then just generally noting that we generally monitor for labs and definitely HIV status every three months. And then STI, we monitor every six months and then can vary depending on risk. This is a little bit more about monitoring for on PrEP therapy. So as you can see at baseline, uh, we monitor multiple different labs. And then every three months, as I mentioned, is how we most frequently monitor. Um, and then every six months, depending on risk. And then hepatitis B would be yearly. And just to note, too, uh, why that's important, is I mentioned that Truvada is also used to treat uh, hepatitis B. So if a patient already has hepatitis B and we don't know and then we stop PrEP, that can cause a hepatitis B flare. So that's the concern with hepatitis B. As far as discontinuation of PrEP therapy and when that would be indicated, so a new HIV diagnosis would certainly be a reason to discontinue PrEP. As I mentioned, it's only for HIV-negative individuals. Um, so that you would want to stop PrEP and link the patient to an HIV specialist at that point. Um, Self-discontinuation of PrEP or if PrEP is no longer indicated, um, we would want the patient to make sure that they have, they have an HIV test at the end just to make sure and really just clarify the reason for discontinuation. Uh, PrEP is essentially not indicated when there are no longer risk factors for HIV acquisition. So just really making sure to the patient understands that what those risk factors are and make sure that they don't have those anymore. <laughs> 
As far as side effects go of PrEP, uh, the most common short-term side effects, they usually only last for a few weeks. Uh, most common side effects include headache and nausea. Less common side effects are the GI-related side effects, so diarrhea, abdominal pain, and then sometimes some myalgias. Um, decreased creatinine clearance, as you saw from the monitoring screen and what we mentioned before, we do monitor kidney function while on PrEP therapy. Um, but it is noted often that there is a small decrease in renal function, which typically does reverse if PrEP is discontinued. Also, there's um, a, little bit, a little bit of a concern for bone mineral density loss, so approximately 1% decrease um, with no increased risk of fractures. And this also uh, reverses when PrEP is discontinued. As far as PrEP use in the community goes, um, of more than 1 million people that are at high risk for contracting HIV, only about 10% are currently receiving PrEP at this time. So as you can see, there's a lot of room for improvement for capture of these patients to improve PrEP uptake. Uh, insurance generally does cover PrEP therapy, but it's still expensive at about $2,000 a month. Uh, but it's also important to note the cost benefits of being on PrEP therapy. So the lifetime medical cost of an HIV, if one becomes HIV infected at age 35, rounds out to be about $300,000. And medical cost saved by avoiding one HIV infection comes out to be about $230,000. So just note that this is a prevention tool and it belongs in primary care, screening for risk factors, and initiating PrEP is the standard of care at this point in time. And now I'm going to turn it over to Emma to talk a little bit more about our QI project in our clinic. Hi. So um, I'm just going to zoom us in a little bit now to the work that we've been doing specifically at our site to uh, increase access to PrEP. Um, so just a little background on who we are. Um, we are in uh, West Los Angeles. We are in the Veterans Administration uh, Health System, and we are specifically um, represent the homeless patient line care team, which is uh, geared specifically towards providing primary care in an interdisciplinary housing first uh, model um, geared towards veterans who are homeless or uh, have been housed for less than a year. Um, our particular site is the largest in Los Angeles of three different sites. Um, we serve 2,200 homeless veterans, um, and it is a teaching um, and academic clinic. And so there, in addition to our 58 full-time uh, permanent staff, we, there are also 26 trainees from a variety of disciplines. Um, our group, our QI group, um, is a group of trainees from a variety of disciplines. We mentioned uh, pharmacy, social work, medicine and um, nurse practitioners are all represented, as well as a number of faculty uh, advisors for support. Um, we recognized um, in fall 2018, we kind of came together and we recognized that despite being an above average risk population of both veterans and homeless veterans specifically, PrEP was being prescribed at very, very low rates and we suspected that it was being underprescribed. So we um, looked at why this might be, and we found a number of both cultural and um, structural factors. The most glaring was that PrEP um, prescribing privileges were actually restricted to infectious disease departments um, and relied on a specialty referral to be initiated and actually maintained. So um, other factors that we saw were um, other structural supports such as workflows um, and um, other uh, protocols for management, as well as um, a lack of routine screening and identification of eligible patients. So the goals we set for this project were to obtain prescribing privileges for primary care providers and pharmacists within the homeless patient clinic um, to uh, increase identification of patients who are eligible for PrEP. Um, and ultimately to initiate PrEP therapy in 10% of eligible patients who were not already on it by February of 2020. Uh, you can see here a little bit more of, um, of an expansion of our exploration of um, 
causal, causal factors involved in, um, in this underprescribing. And we found um, a few different trends. So one, a couple of the things that I wanted to highlight is, um, is a kind of lack of perceived risk um, on the part of patients and providers. And I think that that's related to and also perpetuates um, a lack of screening. Um, and I think one of the things that kind of informs that, both in the VA and in general, is a perception that we spoke to briefly earlier that HIV is really um, kind of a gay disease and is only relevant to the MSM community, um, particularly in populations that may use um, injection drugs or may use the services of sex workers or be sex workers themselves. Um, of course, we know that uh, there are, in fact, many other risk factors that can make people susceptible to this infection. Um, we also found a number of other, um, of other barriers, some of which were historical, such as, um, such as uh, kind of concern and apprehension about the safety of the medication, about the cost, um, discomfort with prescribing, um, and discomfort with asking questions around sexual and drug health. Here you can see a bit of an overview of our QI process. And this um, just goes into depth a little bit of some of the ways that we worked to um, address some of these barriers. Um, I believe you all have this slide, so I won't get into detail with this, but it's here for your reference. Um, just as an overview, in terms of how we looked at addressing some of the system barriers, we um, worked closely with infectious disease and uh, specifically with uh, Jen Falter, who was um, from that department and uh, is on this call now. Um, and we worked to identify a standardized training that primary care providers could complete in order to be approved by our pharmacy department to prescribe um, Truvada for uh, prophylaxis. We also identified it, um, another problem, which was that uh, recommended testing uh, requires um, regular HIV and STD testing. But we did not have um, either point of care HIV tests, rapid tests, or gonorrhea chlamydia swabs in the clinic. So um, we were able to have the lab uh, approve rapid processing of HIV tests so that patients who hadn't had labs done before their appointments would still be able to get their prescription in a timely manner, uh, as well as um, enabling self patient self-collection of gonorrhea and chlamydia swabs at the laboratory. And then we've done, um, uh, have in progress and have started as well, a number of changes in our electronic medical record, CPRS. Some of these tools involve um, working to adapt uh, an automated reminder. Um, it's one of the functionalities that the VA EMR has. Um, and this is also creates a trackable, um, a trackable uh, health factor that enables us to um, track risk factors and prescribing. Um, we're also working to develop um, and adapt order sets, as well as templates for, templates for progress notes. Um, and then we have, um, as well, a dashboard that pulls data based on ICD-10 codes to um, enable us to identify patients who may be at risk and eligible for PrEP. Um, and we've been working to improve that dashboard, particularly um, in capturing uh, injection drug use as a risk factor. We also have done um, a number of uh, interventions aimed at addressing more of the cultural barriers. So um, we found just through kind of preliminary um, informal surveys uh, that there was actually pretty low uh, awareness that PrEP even existed um, among our, our broader staff. And so we have done some trainings aimed at increasing awareness of that and also at um, helping to disseminate understanding of what uh, factors may put somebody at risk so that um, staff members, even outside of the person prescribing, can help to educate patients and to identify those who may be at risk. For prescribers, we did a little bit more in-depth training. Um, and we concentrated um, on uh, developing skills and, um, and sharing uh, pertinent questions for sexual and drug history taking, um, including developing and distributing a pocket tool to help providers kind of remember what questions to ask. Um, 
And then we also um, did uh, some training around kind of perceptions of what the scope of um, PrEP prescribing is, really emphasizing its role as prevention rather than as specialty care to um, aimed at enhancing comfort of providers. Um, there's a little bit of a mystique around HIV medications um, coming from kind of the early days of HIV treatment. Um, and that's been extended to Truvada for prophylaxis, but really isn't warranted. It's a very safe medication, and it's a very easy one to prescribe. Um, and so to enhance the kind of provider's confidence in prescribing this medication, we also did pretty thorough training um, in uh, the risks, side effects, contraindications, and monitoring, similar to what we went over today um, in a little bit more detail. We also have been um, working on developing workflows for the clinic, and that's aimed somewhat at addressing kind of the what now factor um, when something's not um, currently being done frequently in a clinic. A lot of times staff will identify that it needs to be done, but they don't really know how to execute it. So for most disciplines, that simply involves uh, creating a pathway to uh, facilitate a warm handoff to somebody who can prescribe and order testing. Um, and then for prescribers, it um, gives a little more detail in how to outline and um, for scheduling staff, when to schedule, et cetera. Um, in terms of helping with kind of uh, in generating enthusiasm and overcoming some of the stigma and discomfort around um, its association with you know, sex and drugs, we identified some discipline champions who have been indispensable in um, helping to promote this project. Um, We've also had um, been very fortunate in having a high level of uh, buy-in from our management team. Um, and data identified from the dashboard I mentioned before has been helpful in generating that urgency. Um, you can see here uh, one of our workflows identifying different um, disciplines' roles in, uh, in the process of initiating PrEP. Um, and in terms of our next steps, we, as I mentioned, still some of these um, tools, particularly in the medical record and the workflows, are in process. Um, we have a new batch of trainees coming in. It will be standardized for all of them to be trained in prescribing PrEP and, um, and approved uh, as part of their onboarding. Going forward, we're hoping to uh, expand the RN and LVN role in the clinic protocols, as well as disseminate um, prescribing from uh, primary care for homeless patients to our women's health clinic, um, our substance use clinic, um, and ultimately to our broader uh, primary care clinic. So we'll open now for questions. Um, and Great. Thank you so much. Um, if folks could go ahead and type in questions into the chat box down there, we'll take a couple of minutes um, to go through those. I do want to note that um, there was a, a comment added to our chat box um, from Kristen, also from the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System, um, that coupons are available uh, for PrEP um, to help address that cost and are available through the pharmacy. Yeah. Um, um, yes. So one of the things that we didn't really address here is cost, and that's because at the VA, cost is a very different issue. It's, um, it's a kind of an all-in-one situation. In the broader community, there are a lot of resources for helping to cover some of that cost, um, and we've uh, included a few resources here. Um, as Kristen mentioned, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies for this medication, Gilead, and also for a lot of medications can uh, often provide coupons for discounts uh, for patients who are uninsured. Um, there's also, I think we mentioned, many insurance companies actually cover it now, uh, and I believe Medicaid does as well. And Gilead has also made a commitment to providing free or reduced cost prep to um, thousands of people in the next few years, and so particularly when we're thinking about working with the homeless and vulnerable, um, there are a lot of resources that are available for our patient population. It just requires a little bit of digging, and uh, Gilead has definitely had some not positive press recently, and so <laughs> this, is, this is their way to try to gain back some, some goodwill, and also we do anticipate some generic uh, 
uh, versions coming on the market, and this may also be their attempt to get you ready to engage with them on their product before that happens. Thank you. Um, there's another question that came in asking if you could share the patient engagement rate following um, PrEP medication adherence, um, lab testing follow-up, and no-shows. Unfortunately, we don't really have um, good data yet. It's a little too early in our uh, implementation process to have collected data on that. Um, I will say just quickly, you know, um, missing appointments or having um, poor medication adherence is considered a contraindication to initiating PrEP. Um, I think, you know, we, we spoke to how important that is, but I think that it's also important with the um, homeless population to uh, to have a, a, a little bit of flexibility with that um, understanding that they often have chaotic lives and having a follow-up shortly after an intended one um, can be okay. Um, I, think, I think we mentioned that the medication, while it's uh, indicated for daily use can uh, actually be very effective with as few as four doses a week. So um, not being able to come on time for every single appointment isn't necessarily an absolute contraindication. And just to reiterate, our policy for prescribing PrEP is that we never give longer than a 90-day fill, right. and we don't put refills on that. So it's part of our protocol to really just not provide any further refills until we're able to make contact with the patient. Correct, yes. Yeah. Um, so the, the rationale for, um, for having frequent follow-up and, and not um, having a, a large supply for patients who have spotty adherence is the concern for, uh, for um, contracting HIV and then developing resistance if you continue to take the medication not knowing that you have it. So providing a short supply can really help to reduce that risk. Thank you. Um, there's also a question, if you could clarify the baseline labs that are done to indicate PrEP. Yeah, so let me go back to that slide. Oh, okay. So this slide, this slide here, uh, slide 23, kind of goes over all of the labs that we look at at baseline, so HIV, um, HBV, Hep C, renal function, STI, pregnancy test, if applicable. Um, so as you, this is kind of what we look at at baseline, and then every three months we reassess a lot of these labs again. Q6 months is when we start looking at renal function, STI, if not needed more frequently. So this slide here kind of shows what we look at at baseline. There's also, these slides should be available to you, um, and there's also a, um, a, a number of resources online. I, I recommend looking at the CDC. They have a very clear protocol for prescribing and monitoring, which um, our protocol is based on. Yeah, this, this closely reflects, if not completely, <laughs> the <laughs> CDC guidelines. Right. Perfect, yes, and the slides are in the resource pod. Um, I know a couple questions have come in about that. Um, so those are on the bottom right corner of your screen, um, and they will also be sent around along with a copy of the recording in a few days. Um, there's another question asking if you have any thoughts to share on getting buy-in from prescribers in an area where HIV rates are relatively low. I mean, I think the, the biggest Tool, the biggest feather we have in our cap right now is that it's a U.S. Preventative Task Force Grade A recommendation to screen. It, you know, this is a preventative disease at this point, but you have to ask your patients some questions that not all providers are really comfortable asking. You know, the CDC numbers show about 25% of new infections are heterosexual men and women, and while the individual risk for an individual man or woman may, heterosexual man or woman may be low compared to the risk for a man who has sex with men, there are a lot more straight people in the world than there are uh, heter uh, homosexual people. And so 25% of new infections are heterosexual infections. And so this is about re-education for providers that this is not just a concern for the LGBT community and that people have risky sex 
in multiple ways. <laughs> and, you know, you have to ask for it. I mean, I think the key thing, right, is really um, understanding what the realistically the risk is for the specific patient. So um, if you're in an area that has low HIV rates overall, that may or may not be true for a particular subpopulation. So when you look at the MSM community, the reason that rates are so high in that community has a little bit to do with the, with the style of transmission, but it mostly has to do with epidemiology and that that is a small and sexually isolated community that because it had, um, it had, uh, it was, was where the community initiated its spread and now has endemically high rates. Um, that can be true as well in um, homeless and drug using communities. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is that it's really, really important in, in any population to assess the risk of infection, um, including sexually transmitted infections, but all infection really. Um, if truly that patient is at uh, low or no infection, then, you know, I don't see the need to convince prescribers to give them PrEP. But um, as long as that uh, screening is really happening, um, I think it's the important thing. And then I see a question about Ryan White funding. I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that. Um, I was just checking that out. Um, it looks like oh. Ryan White funding does not currently cover PrEP. Um, unfortunately. Um, however, I think as you mentioned, there are a lot of other strategies that um, can be used to uh, mitigate some of the cost concerns there. Um, we have a few more minutes, so if folks have any additional questions, please uh, continue to type those into the chat box. Um, I have a quick question for you as well, um, kind of going off of some of the um, discussion about getting buy-in. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the, the training that you did for primary care providers around prescribing and increasing that comfort level. Sure. Um, one of the things that we really focused on was that the contraindications for this medication are very, very small. Um, and so when providers, when we first began to talk to our colleagues about bringing this to primary care. They think there was a lot of concern and anxiety about what extra work this might mean for prescribers. And so a lot of our work was on education of what the drug was and how simple it really is to prescribe. And, we're, and the monitoring is not monitoring that requires a lot of extra stuff um, either. And so our, our real emphasis was on this is not going to take a lot more of your time. The follow-up um, and assessment shouldn't take much of your time either. And this is just a very, very safe drug. You're not really needing to worry about serious side effects. You don't have to worry about really tracking up and making sure that um, bad things are, are not happening. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of that was on how to really get a sexual and in, uh, injection drug history in a way that feels natural for you as a provider and actually invites the, the patient to be truthful and forthcoming to you. And not everyone has that skill set. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did create um, some very, uh, you know, some, some very specific wording to provide to providers so that they could try it out and see what worked for them. And, um, the, and it was adapted from the slide about asking the sexual history that we shared with you in this presentation. One conceptual framework that we really wanted our, our uh, primary care providers to incorporate was um, within our clinic, we talk a lot about harm reduction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is one additional tool that we can use for persons who inject drugs along with, say, a Narcan prescription, referrals for needle exchange, we can offer them PrEP. Or for those with um, risky sexual behaviors, you know, in addition to talking about condoms or contraception or STI screening, we can additionally offer them PrEP. So we're trying to really include this as one tool in our toolbox for prevention based on behaviors. Mm -hmm. I think one of the great things about um, about PrEP also is that um, I think that 
providers and primary care providers love to offer people solutions. Um, and I think a lot of people feel uncomfortable asking about sexual behaviors if they don't have a clear uh, reason in their mind that that might change their management. Um, this, uh, I think, can really also be a, a way to motivate providers to ask about sexual risk and, and have a frank discussion about sexual risk because really it does impact management and, and there are things that we can do to reduce that risk um, uh, in terms of PrEP but also in terms of other risk management interventions. And just to branch off a little bit more about the training that we provided, um, so that came kind of in the form of the pocket card that we created for them as sort of a quick reference. Um, but a little bit more formally, at the VA we have, um, we already actually had a built-in prep training as part of just some of the continuing education resources that we have for VA employees already. Mm -hmm. So we essentially went through that in a staff meeting and guided them through that to kind of help them complete that training. And um, it's a really good training that already existed that a lot of, we just basically disseminated to the clinic. But the pocket card serves as a good kind of quick reference for them just to remember too. Mm -hmm. And those materials exist in the, in the world. Um, <laughs> the CDC has a lot of material. Um, Health and Human Services had a, has a lot of material. So those of you who are thinking about how you might bring this into your clinical settings, you know, we stole lots of stuff. That yeah. stuff exists in the world. The CDC is a wonderful, wonderful resource for, for training. Um, and it really is, it's, a, it's about getting people over that hump of defining HIV as, as only an LGBT um, concern. Um, one, one last thing that I wanted to speak to on that subject, and this is um, in some ways a little beyond the scope of this presentation and, and even of our training, but one of the concerns that we encounter here is um, there are, unfortunately, there's a pretty high rate of uh, sexual harassment at the VA as staff. Um, and so some staff have concerns about initiating conversations about sexual behavior because of that. Um, I think that one of the benefits of a really clear training about how to get a good sexual history is that it normalizes those questions in a way that isn't about curiosity, that isn't about um, you know having a you know a, a boundary crossing conversation in any way. It really just is about uh, clinically assess assessing risk factors, and I think um, that that can be a really valuable skill for a lot of clinicians. Thank you so much. Um, another comment came in um, mentioning the importance of um, also looking at the implications on transgender patients and looking at some of those statistics um, and included a link to a fact sheet um, by the CDC. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we'll try to make sure that that um, also gets listed with the resources for this webinar. Um, that is also covered in an upcoming fact sheet that the council will be releasing um, on PrEP um, that is currently under review. So hopefully uh, that will be coming out in a few weeks, so stay tuned on that. Thank you for that consideration. Um, uh, this, this is Lillian Gelberg. I wanted to say that I'm just delighted with the incredible work our interprofessional trainees and team have done on this quality improvement project. And they picked PrEP because it's in um, importance to our population and the mandate from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force to implement this in all of our primary care clinics. And I would say that the interprofessional nature of the work just made it a fantastic project from start to finish, you know, that every aspect of interprofessionalism was involved in creating this project. And I'm just really proud of our trainees and our faculty. <laughs> Thanks, Lillian. It sounds like a really great project. Um, and thank and you. One other question come in um, relating to insurance coverage. Um, I know that you mentioned it's a little bit different for the VA, but if you have any insight you'd like to share about insurance coverage for PrEP, that would be great. Most commercial and most Medicaid um, insurances cover it, and I think we can only anticipate that it will be covered even wider with the U.S. Preventative Task Force um, Grade A recommendation as well as this Health and Human Services Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is for um, 
The issue is less for our patient population. Uh, if you have very little money, this is actually a medication that is easier to get uh, with a very low out-of-pocket cost or no out-of-pocket cost. Uh, it's for persons who are of higher income and have a, you know, a commercial insurance that the out-of-pocket um, copay may be quite high. And uh, that's also where Gilead has agreed to do some patient stuff. But for our patient population, um, cost should not be an issue. It just may require a little bit of digging into how to connect them with uh, the prescription. Yeah, yeah as, they, as they mentioned, it really is cost saving to prescribe this medication if you are within a system where your HIV care will be paid for by the same people who will pay for your HIV prevention. So the, the advantage of working within safety net systems is that that is the case. In private insurance, that can be externalized, um, meaning that the, uh, the issues down the road are not going to come back to bite whoever is refusing to pay for the medication now. So that's where we see kind of more of the gap. Um, thank you so much. Um, it looks like that is the last question that has come in. Um, I wanted to thank you all again for presenting today and, and sharing the great work that you've done um, around quality improvement and PrEP um, in the VA and LA. Um, I know I definitely learned a lot, um, including kind of how many folks are seeing their provider in the year before diagnosis and thinking about ways that we can be proactive in that. Um, Thank you all uh, for joining um, and listening in on today's webinar and engaging with the content. Again, the presentation materials and a link to the webinar um, will be available on our website at nhchc.org in the next couple of days. Um, a survey for evaluating today's presentation will also open in your browser at the close of this session. Um, so please fill that out so we can hear your feedback. Um, we really appreciate your time today. Um, and with that, this webinar is closed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.